Welcome to the Women's March Canada podcast, making the equality of women in Canada the new norm. This is episode 32, entitled Wellness, Mindfulness, and the Human Spirit. I'm Leanne Castellino, and I'm your host, inspiring, in uniting, and leading the charge for the advancement of women in Canada. Please welcome our guest this week, Salam Debs. Salam is the owner of Community of Hearts Yoga Studio and the founder of Salam Love Wellness. She's also a mother, writer, activist, poet, singer, and songwriter. Salam, thanks for joining us. Thank you, Leanne. First of all, let's start with what led you down this career path? Wow. Well, um, I actually found meditation and mindfulness a very long time ago. Um, I had a, an aunt who was going through cancer at that time and um, who we knew was at the, you know, the ending of her life. And her children had introduced you know, Deepak Chopra and some amazing tools in her life to kind of help her through that. And that was probably about 15 years ago. And I, I, you know, experienced that, um, the practice of meditation and yoga, and it transformed my life. And from that point, I started to, I slowly moved into yoga as a physical practice as well. When you say that it transformed your life, can you give us a sense of specifically how it impacted you? Well, I think before I had, you know, before I knew about yoga and meditation, I think a lot of my life was very, there was a lot of drama, there was a lot of emotional, um, mental trauma from my past and my, my childhood. And it was the first time that I felt like I could be still and be be relaxed in my body and my mind. And I felt for the first time that I could actually control that kind of mind, you know, thought process that was on autopilot. It was the first time that I recognized that that could, that I could shift that. I didn't have to think those reoccurring thoughts all the time. When you talk about your yoga studio, what would you say is unique or different about Community of Hearts Yoga? Community of Hearts Yoga. So I think what makes us different is we're definitely we're not a a brand if you may we don't we're not a franchise like many of the awesome studios that are here locally in kw and throughout canada and so when i took over the studio the original owner had started it about you know 10 or 12 years before that and she started in her living room so people had been like practicing in her living room Room. and it was this very organic she was you know process some of the people had like it was their first time experiencing yoga you know 20 years ago and when I took over the studio like a lot of these clients have been coming for more than 10 years um, and we're just so con- had kind of that the see this is what I, I experienced yeah we lost you there for a sec, but I, yes. will, uh, I will say that it's KW, it refers to Kitchener Waterloo, which is in Ontario, Canada. So just for, for people listening and watching, <laughs> um, what would you say your relationship to intersectionality is and how has it impacted you in your life? Wow, intersectionality. So I think over the years, I've, I've recognized and identified myself as a feminist, of course, and that's been a huge part of my life and a huge way in the way I raise my son, the way that I, I parent, the way that I move in the world, um, the choices that I make. And I think the amazing part of this you know, word, you know, intersectionality finally being coined over the years is that it finally recognized the experience of the woman of color and how it can be very drastically different, how it overlaps, you know, the, the um, experience of being a woman of color, of being, you know, depending on your ethnic, ethnicity, like being a di- di- um, diaspora, having a family, parents that are immigrants, going through that experience, you know, living in parts of Toronto where I grew up, which was, um, you know, low income and low poverty, a poverty, you know, stricken areas. And I think for me, how it's really impacted me is that I've, I finally have an understanding of why I've been so impacted by these different things. And now I can make a difference in the language that I use, in the way that I support women in this community, in the way that I create.
and um, you know programs, just tools in terms of helping to educate yoga studios and helping to educate gyms so that they understand how to approach their clients, how to create an environment that really allows for people to feel accepted and seen. It's so interesting because um, you are of Ethiopian descent. You describe briefly there your upbringing. Was there a particular event that you can look back on in your childhood that you said really changed everything for you? Or was it a series of events over time? Yeah, so for me, my story is that my parents, um, they came in 84 from Ethiopia. At that time, they were, they were affected by the regime and the conflict that was happening in Ethiopia. So I was two years old when we moved to Canada. And immediately, my parents divorced. So it's amazing when I look back at my, my life experience and I look at who I am today, it's clear that when I, I see the timeline and they went through this divorce, my, my mom raised me in Toronto as a single mother. We lived in some of the most dangerous parts of Toronto at that time, which was in the Regent Park area, and as well as the, um, uh, you know, Scarborough in, in, in the St. Clair area. And uh, my dad was living in Ottawa. He was very educated. He was pursuing education um, and his master's and multiple master's degrees. And so you know, as I grew up, I kind of had this exposure to Ethiopian culture, first of all, being very concrete in my household. And so I was exposed to a lot of the challenges that come with living in underprivileged areas in Toronto growing up as a young kid. And so I was seeing like the Ethiopian culture that was in my household, which had all of the nourishing qualities that I needed. And I also was exposed to a lot of the, the hardships that came with living in underprivileged areas. Um, you know, I also was, you know, I also had experienced uh, abuse at the age of nine. I was molested at the age of nine. I experienced sexual assault at the age of um, 16 and so on, became a single mom at the age of 21. And so I had these kind of very, you know, if you were to check off on a, on a list of like, okay, you've been through this, you've been through this, you've been through this. And interesting enough, these experiences really catapulted me to want to make a difference, to really want to use my voice and a platform that I could actually encourage young girls, young women, especially women of color that are not really represented in, you know, for example, the industry of yoga, where we don't see the diversity, where I could say, you know, um, I'm not a healer, I'm not a therapist. And yet yoga and meditation have, has this incredible way of helping people to get in touch with those parts of yourselves that you kind of suppress, of course, to be able to survive trauma. So I, I think that's how they've all kind of inter, interconnected for me. That's so interesting because I'm thinking of a few things here. First of all, how do you reach that audience? Because as you describe it, you know, different cultures have obviously different ways of looking at the things. And then when you talk about some of these taboo topics, let's call them that, like, how do you go about reaching this audience? Yes, exactly. And that's the that's what I've been looking and researching and trying to figure out over the last couple of years of how, why, why don't I see diversity in, in these spaces? Why do we not see these places that are supposed to be specific to self-care? And what I realized through my own kind of reflection and research is that, you know, our cultures, if I look at even the Ethiopian culture, I don't remember ever seeing my mother or my aunts ever doing anything for themselves or taking the time to just rest and offer themselves that type of nourishment they were always you know working always making something always making coffee buna always like you know always uh, you know attending to somebody else and uh, another thing I noticed is that, you know, talking about these things weren't part of our culture. You didn't talk about trauma. You didn't talk about the hardships that you had. There was this kind of strong woman um, perspective that I think has been useful in many ways, but for our generation, for my generation and my son's generation, isn't really useful anymore because we want to move beyond survival. We want to move towards thriving and healing. And their, their perspective was that they had to survive, which made sense. So those conversations didn't happen. So today, what I found is that 
just the just the fact that I am a yoga teacher and that I am trying to create this um, this experience and that people see me online or in spaces at fundraisers that they go oh wow like I didn't realize that that was that was possible that you that a woman of color that an Ethiopian you know woman would be interested in these types of things one interesting story that I, I always remember is there's a woman here in, in the Kitchener Waterloo area who has a camp um, called the African African camp for kids and so this this camp was created in order to create diversity to help these young youth that were of African background to feel a sense of belonging and to feel proud of their culture and because a lot of these young children really didn't see representation of you know, people that look like them. And so of course there was a feelings of shame and feeling of wanting to be different and to look different. And so she brought in all of these, um, you know, firefighters, these men of color, women of color that were firefighters, that were doctors, that were nurses, that had all these like incredible, you know, pilots that would come in and talk to the children. And the children would like, their eyes would open wide and they would look at these people and they, they'd be amazed that, that there were, it was like they became like superheroes to them. Um, because it wasn't just something that they saw on a regular basis. So that was the connection. That was like the mind connection for them to go, oh, wow, okay, so this is something I can do, which is why the importance of representation um, for women is important. But then for women of color, it extends out to that extra, ex, um, intersectionality piece that says that we need to also be aware of your marketing. What kind of marketing are you putting out there? If you own a business, if you own a yoga studio or a gym, if your marketing is showing, you know, white women, you know, with blonde hair and men and young and, you know, all the different um, kind of ways in which we promote in our, in the marketing world, then we're saying, whether we know it or not, we're communicating a certain language. We're saying that this is not for you, that this is for these types of people. So it's important that that's what I've kind of looked at. It's like, I've changed my marketing I've changed the way in which I, how I reach out to people. I've attended different events and been part of different diversity events to help um, put the the information out there. And, and then it's at, at the end of the day, it's like, I've seen the change. I've seen the change of seeing people of different backgrounds start to come to the studio because they see me, number one. And because I think subliminally they're seeing the marketing is different. Um, and, and it's part of why I'm, I'm starting to rebrand my studio to kind of create a name that I think will help to encourage diversity inclusivity. So, yeah. Wow. So many incredibly important topics in, in your answer there. Let me just break that down a little bit. When you talk about, um, having seen women in the course of your life who don't prioritize themselves first. That's such a huge common theme among most women, especially mothers. Yes. What advice would you give to those women who struggle with that? And, um, you know, how do you get them to make themselves a priority? So how I've looked at it over the years, because I, I remember with my son when he was younger, I remember cutting up apples for him all the time. And I would cut all these apples up and all these fruits and all these healthy things. And then I, I recognized over a period of time that I wasn't actually eating the apples. Like I would cut them up for both of us, but he would eat them. And, but in my mind, because he was eating them, like I felt like I was eating them too. I think this is kind of like the philosophy for a lot of mothers. What I realized though, is that we are, we are setting an example for our children and how they're going to you know, move in the world and how they're going to experience life. When we know that mental illness and depression and anxiety and you know, health issues are just such at a high right now, stress being such a big part, then we model that. We model for our children the way, the way in which we start to create self-care for ourselves. So what I've realized is this, is that we, we, we teach our children by example, but we also, what our children really want for us is for us to grow ourselves. It's, it's a quote that I take from Dr. Shivali Atisbari, who writes a book called The Conscious Parent. And I think about being, being a conscious parent means taking that oxygen mask you know, on the plane, that kind of, that um, idea where we, we receive the oxygen first and then we can give it to our children and to our loved ones. Because if we don't fill up our cup, then we're offering, offering a depleted part of ourselves. So the importance of me filling up my cup, for example, when I look at my son and 
I used to have a lot of guilt about being an entrepreneur and like working full time and like really working beyond hours that I ever did when I was in the corporate world. I work much more than I ever did. But because I'm so passionate about what I do and because I love what I do, my son can look at where I am today, although we're, we don't have like quantity, we have quality. And so that he knows is like feeding my soul my work is feeding my soul. And so he understands that. He understands that the passion around it, the reason why I work the way I do, the reason why I might take the time to go and get a massage or get a Reiki treatment or go do something else is because I am growing myself and filling myself up so that I can be my best for him. What has struck you about the women that you've met in the course of, of what you do and why they don't prioritize themselves. Is there a common theme there or is it just what we all uh, tend to use as excuses of, of always nurturing and supporting others? I think there's a common theme. I think it, there's a feeling of guilt. I think guilt is a big thing that we've been, re we've received the rhetoric and the narrative our whole lives that we are supposed to be doers, that our job is to do. We're supposed to, you know, get the food ready, clean the house. We're, so, we're constantly, it's rare that I've, to see a mother just sit down and relax. It's such a strange thing because even I'll find myself when I'm at home wanting to get something else done. Um, and very, and I think that that is a conversation and, and a, a narrative that men receive as well, for sure, in a different way from maybe a work perspective. However, I think that what yoga, what makes yoga really special is that it's conversations about being. And being means that you have to sit with yourself long enough to maybe uncover things that might be hurtful, maybe painful, might be uncomfortable. And oftentimes I think it's just our society as a whole too that doesn't give us permission as women to sit down and to look at ourselves and to be with ourselves unapologetically. So what I found is that there's feelings of guilt, there's feelings of restlessness. We haven't really practiced it in our lives. And the more and more that we practice it, we start to see the, the benefits. We start to see the transformation in ourselves, that certain tension that we've been holding in our body, like in our fascia, in our connective tissue everywhere is something that we can start to release. But I, it definitely is a narrative that we've been taught from a very young age. Certainly in the world we live in today, there is so much noise and there is so much white noise that it's easy to get lost in all of that. Um, just going back to your childhood very quickly here, what would you say got you through all of that? I mean, you had different, very, you know, significant experiences, many of them negative at different ages in, in, as you were a child. What got you through that? I think for me, I've always been a seeker. Um, when I was younger, I was very much, it looked like religion. I used to go to church a lot and I loved going to church to the point where I, I remember my parents, my mom, when I would get in trouble, she would, she, like my punishment would be like, you can't go to church on Sunday because she knew how much I enjoyed the atmosphere, the fellowship and, and the singing. I was a singer and a writer and, and doing all these things. It was like my, my creative platform was in church and it was kind of this community that I felt supported by. So, you know, as, as I've gotten older, you know, I've, I've of course reconciled in many ways, I, I think my maybe philosophies around religion. However, what I, what I see as the common ground is that I was always a seeker. I was always wanting to ask the questions. I was that curious person that was like, okay, well, this has happened, but why? Why does these things happen? Or why is there these conflicts between culture? Why is there a conflict between, why as a woman do I have to be fearful, fearful when I walk in the world? Why can't I walk in the world and feel confident? And I started doing a lot of reading and a lot of research and really starting to find kind of these like these role models, these women outside of myself that were, you know, maybe famous women like Oprah um, that I would look to. And I saw that they had similar experiences as I did and that they were able to overcome them. And I would listen and kind of infiltrate my mind with their philosophy. And I think it just started to become a way of my life. I just started to say that I just wasn't going to give up 
that I wasn't going to allow those things to tear me down. And, um, you know, I, I had a very strong mother, although she was a challenging person, there was strength in her. And my father was very um, educated. So I took the ideas of like really trying to educate yourself to gain knowledge. And so I think that a combination of my seeking, my spirituality, my, my desire to learn, I was hungry to learn more, and my kind of resiliency and what my a friend of mine would say anti-fragility was like this way of saying like, I will persevere. And I had all these tools. I was always looking for tools, which would make sense that I finally found meditation and yoga. What, whatever the tool was, if it was beneficial to me, I would, I would hold on to it. So I think that they, they really helped me to see myself not as a victim, but as someone that has experienced these things and, and ha I have an ability to be able to share my experiences. For some reason, I've, I've been able to overcome it. I don't think that that's like a prescription I would say everybody can do. Somehow I was able to do that. And so I try to use kind of the ways that I saw the world and the tools that I used to be able to offer that out to other people and women especially. Uh, just one last question. How would you say that your relationship with men has been impacted? You talk about your father, yeah. divorce and all of those things, um, being a single mother. Has it been impacted and if so, how? Wow, that's an interesting question. Uh, <laughs> so um, it's a very, it's a two part conversation. I think traditionally and conventionally, my relationship to men have been challenging because of the fact that I, I had those experiences. So I was constantly in conflict, it felt, with men. However, when I had my son at the age of 21, that all changed because of the fact that I finally realized that he, you know, he came into this world with this kind of like blanket way of seeing the world. He didn't really have perspectives. He didn't have any dogma or ideology in, infused in him. And I saw this opportunity to use my relationship to, to being a mother and raising this boy and guiding this boy to be like, okay, let's see this kind of like a social experiment. Let's see if I, if I nurture the parts of him that are really positive, if I allow him to be himself, like what happens then? And what I observed is that he just was this very emotionally intelligent, very kind, very loving, very compassionate person who really didn't, he wasn't really the stereotypical perspective that we normally see in, in boys and what we see in TV and media and what, how, you know, what we think our boys are supposed to turn out. And so that transformed. And so I started doing talks and, and inspirational talks about that, this idea that we're constantly looking to, you know, we're telling our young girls to do, to be a, an act a certain way, to dress a certain way, to, to really to learn self-defense lessons and to do all these things to protect themselves. And yet I think the responsibility really where we can make a huge shift is if we help our boys, not if we guide them to be different, but we guide them to be who they truly are, like allow them to not, not to infiltrate them with the boys will be boys language, not to tell them when we see them cry to allow them to have that space to be themselves. And so my relationship to men has transformed now because I see the potential, I see the possibilities in my son, and it has transformed the way that I, I interact with men now because now I see them as they also are a victim to our societal perspectives and what we're teaching boys. Wow, how interesting. Salam Devs, thank you so much for your time today. We really appreciate it. Thank you so much, Leanne. Thank you to everyone tuning in. Your comments are always welcome and encouraged. Please subscribe to the Women's March Canada channel and receive updates every time that we upload upload a new video or podcast. Our mission across Canada is to stand together in solidarity with our partners and our children for the protection of our rights, our safety, and our health and our families, recognizing that our vibrant and diverse communities are the strength of our country. This is the Women's March Canada podcast. You can find us on Twitter at Women's March CDA and our website, womensmarchcanada.com. I'm Leanne Castellino. Have a great day.